You are listening to the Lawyer Stories Podcast with host Benny Gold. Lawyer Stories was founded in July 2017 on Instagram and is an expanding global network of lawyers and law students sharing their personal journeys to the noble profession of the practice of law. Join us on this podcast as we dig deeper into these stories and hear from lawyers and law students from around the world in all areas of the legal profession. Here at Lawyer Stories, we believe that every lawyer has a story. What's yours? Case Roads, a feature-rich cloud-based practice management application that costs up to 70% less than other providers, is designed to be incredibly easy to use and allows you to securely work from anywhere. Get all the functionality you need for one low price per user. Take your firm to the next level. Work smarter, improve operations, and get paid faster. For the entire month of February, book your trial today at caseroads.com and receive 20% off with your Lawyer Stories promotion code LS Podcast. Welcome to the Lawyer Stories Podcast with Benny Gold, episode 32 today. Um, and today we welcome in Noam Cohen, currently located in Israel. How are you? <laughs> I'm great. How are you? Good, good. Thanks for being here. Um, I think I mentioned I actually went to Israel on a program called Birthright the first year it was launched, the year 2000. Um, great experience, beautiful place. So fantastic. Yeah, it's a wonderful program. Yeah, it's a, I also attended Birthright. That's in all, that's in like 2005. Yeah. Very yeah. Cool. It's a great program. Yeah. Very cool. So um, you have a very interesting story. Um, and I'm just curious first, like, can you just tell it before we get into um, the law firm that you are a founder of? Um, mm-hmm. So like, where are you from? Like, where, where were you born and raised? Sure. I was born and raised in LA. Um, I guess nothing kind of too interesting there. Um, (laughs) Both my parents are Israeli born and, you know, moved there kind of way before their kids were born. Um, And I'm one of four and we were raised in, you know, a suburban community outside the main city. Um, Yeah. And and so, you know, Israel's always been a part of my life. I've actually only been here for the last two months. Uh, but I spent my entire childhood as well as I should say first year of college in the States, uh, before doing my degree out here actually in Israel and then moving back for 11 years and going to law school in this, in, uh, at Berkeley. Wow. Okay. So yeah. What was it like to go to, you went to Tel Aviv university? Um, yeah, so like what, what was that like, that experience like compared to what it might've been like if you had gone in the States? So I got, I got to experience both. Okay. Uh, I went to UC Santa Barbara for my first year of school uh, and it was fine. I didn't really connect. It wasn't kind of the experience I was looking for. I never really wanted the college, American college experience. I was always much more eager about traveling and uh, you know meeting different types of people. Uh, and so actually in my sophomore year, I already went abroad and I went to Israel and I was part of the exchange program and I went through that and it was a lot of American kids that were part of the exchange yeah, program really. and I wasn't too <laughs> into that either. Uh, and then I had one of my professors say like, why, why are you leaving? You know, And I said, I don't know, I gotta go home and like finish school. And he said, well, why don't you just stay and apply? And so I did and I applied to be part of the, you know, just Israeli student track and I got accepted. And so I ended up doing three more years uh, in Israel. Um, and I double majored in Middle East history where I learned Arabic, kind of, like don't test me, uh, and political science. Uh, and I think the coolest thing about studying in Israel is um, the student population is a lot older because here there's mandatory military service. And then right. after military service, pre-COVID, everyone went traveling. And then you came home and you would take the equivalent of your SATs. And so really the youngest students, undergrad students in Israel are like 23 and 24 years old. And I was like a 19 year old kid uh, right. setting with these people. Uh, and it was fascinating. It was such a cool environment to be an undergrad in. Um, yeah. I mean, which I was definitely sense. not like, the smartest person in the room. Really? Wow. So 
which makes sense because like as a practical matter it is good to do some traveling and do some things before you go into college but i think like our you know our society is so used to the way that it is i mean if somebody goes to law school they might the traditional law student might take a year off or two but you know i think like mm-hmm. now as hindsight 2020 in my life like i realized that you know life experience and learning how to manage time and like getting those experiences in is is very important so yeah i mean maybe there is something to be said for the israeli way sure i mean i i don't know if everyone would choose the mandatory military service and we don't That's want to true, get into yeah. that but i i do think that uh what you see here both for undergraduate students as well as graduate students is there's very there's a lot of intention behind what you're studying and you you come into it as an adult as opposed to an 18 year old right. child you know and yes. so you attend your classes with like a level of seriousness and intent that you don't really see in the American undergrad classroom as much. Right. I don't want to be, you know, overgeneralized, but it's, it's a different caliber for sure. Yeah. Yeah. You're right about the military. I wasn't sort of thinking about that there. I don't think everybody <laughs> sort of choose to do that. Yes. But, you know, I was just sort of thinking about it. I'm like a law school. I took a year off before law school and it was like, I probably would have, I might've like fared better if I had taken like four years off. I don't know. Um, but so that's, I, I, I yeah. get that. So what, so tell me like, I, I, go, go ahead. ahead. Nope. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say it leads to such a rich academic environment when you are studying among people who have done other things yeah. and haven't just gone straight through, straight through undergrad, straight through law school. I think the conversations are just richer. The, the connections are deeper. What people can bring kind of to the classroom. It's just a different level. Yeah. Okay. So and I agree with that. So tell me, like, when did Noam Cohen decide to be a lawyer? Like, did you have that time in your life where you sort of just said, okay, like, I could go this way, but I want to, I want to go to law school. I want to go back to, you know, the States and study at, at Berkeley, right? Yeah, I, I had a few different points in life where it was clear to me that I was going to law school. And the, the first one was in eighth grade, U.S. history, loved it. That was the first time I had announced that I wanted to be a judge to my family and I said, I'm going to law school. Um, But fast forward a little bit, uh, when I was an undergrad uh, in Israel, I was volunteering with Darfur refugees who were um, streaming in actually through the Egyptian border. Um, They started coming through in 2005 here um, as a result of the Darfur genocide and I was volunteering and and that was the first time where I had an aha moment around what can I bring to the table if I'm not a professional right um I there were lawyers involved in the nonprofit I was working at there were other kind of professionals involved and it it was a moment for me of I want more power I want to be able to do more Um, and volunteering is wonderful and and I can come in every day and and do my best but I want to have more impact and so that was the big turning point for me of I'm definitely going to law school and this is my next step. Wow. So how did you select UC Berkeley? Was it just sort of like the location you were in and that was the best school of it, like where you were? Uh, It's a great school. So for me, it was a little bit of a no brainer um, to go to a school like Berkeley. Um, I was really excited to be accepted. I wanted to be back in California. I had lived abroad for four years at that point. I was really young when I moved abroad. You know, I moved back when I was 23. I wanted to get closer to my family. The the two years prior to me starting law school, my mom had gone through uh, cancer and I was abroad for a lot of that. The proximity to home was really important to me. And like I said, I mean, I got accepted to Berkeley. It's a wonderful school. It kind of was a no brainer. They have, you know, amazing social justice initiatives as part of the law school, um, which I, I, you know, took part in extensively as a student. Um, so it, it just became this, you know, I could have gone to other places, but Berkeley seemed in the end like an obvious choice. Okay. So what, like, um, what was your law school experience? Was it a good experience law school? Did you, was it something that you enjoyed? Were there any challenges that you faced or Oh, I write extensively about my law school experience on LinkedIn. I hated law school. Okay. I thought law school was a hazing experience. I I also had a recent post on LinkedIn um, 
uh, that I thought, I think law school is a waste of time. Yeah. Um, so I'm very, very vocal about my thoughts around law school. I mean, it, it is what it is. I'm in a vocation that requires me to attend this, this, you know, to go through this path. Right. Uh, but I think the way law school is taught, it's highly adversarial. I think it beats us down as students. It doesn't build up our confidence. I don't think it provides us with a lot of practical skills for the real no, world. That, that one uh, I agree with hundred percent. Yes. Certainly not as uh, for myself as a transactional attorney, I can say uh, law school didn't prepare me in any way whatsoever to be a yeah. transactional attorney. Um, so that's the short or long answer. I don't know if that was very long of no, I didn't enjoy law school at all. And that's it's a shame because I was very excited about kind of yeah. the, the academic potential. I was very excited about the courses I was going to take, but I was nervous all the time around the cold calling culture. Um, oh, God. I just, that was, yeah. <laughs> I've said in like almost everyone, in a few of my podcasts where we've talked about law school, like that was my least favorite. I mean, I, I think I told like, I don't know, it was early on in the podcast, it still is, but um, in the episodes, somebody asked me and I said, I think there was one day in civil procedure where I got called on and like, it was like from across the room and a mint like came flying out of my mouth because I was so, I just did not like, <laughs> I did not like the the, the Socratic method at all. Um, you know, I, I think I could have handled it better now, but I think back then it's just like, uh, it's awful. It's hard. I thought it was awful. I describe it as I always had sweaty palms. Yeah. I, my heart was always beating. And when I was called on, it didn't matter if I had read the same thing 16 times before my mind just kind of yeah. went blank. Fight or flight. Uh, I learned it, total fight or flight. Your yeah. adrenaline is so high. And again, it's right. so unfortunate because we, we go into law school, I think with a lot of intention, right. Yeah. To, to learn. And, and we're all kind of excited, at least initially about this profession, and I felt really beaten down by the time I graduated law school. And I had also attended kind of shortly after the financial crisis. We were also told things, you know, you would think that when you go to such a kind of highly ranked school that it's fine, you'll be fine. You'll get a job, right. everything will be fine. Right. And our career development office was like, you know, if you're not top of your class here, you yeah. should really look at other options. Like you might not get a, you know, a job in the private sector if that's like what you were looking for. So even there, um, yep. they just, yeah, there's a lot of insecurity. So, so let me, just to ask you one more question about law school, like you said, you think it's it was like a waste of, it could be a waste of time. So like, if it was up to you, like what would the curriculum be? Would it be like just one year, like that first year of like learning how to write and then maybe like the six classes, five or six classes and then that's it? It would it would be an apprenticeship. And okay. I know yeah. that that is okay. a path in California at least. Um, yeah. It would be an apprenticeship and it might include a year of studies. I and, think the, yeah, I mean, and I, I, yeah. yeah. I think the way doctors have it as, as professionals um, where they have to do their rotation and they have to go in and do practical um work i think that's the best way to do it because there are some people that will just take the theory and then you get out there and you're trying to do like <clears throat> you know you're trying to do legal work and it's just unless you have a mentor i feel yeah. you just don't really know what the heck uh you know you have to figure it out yourself i mean law school is a big figured out yourself type of thing so i think when you get out in the world like you're able to survive and figure things out yourself and like that's the to me that's the law school law student mentality but I think um, an apprenticeship and working with a mentor would be 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think I would do sort of like a, you know, the LLMs in, in the States have a one-year program. That's because they hold an LLB. So obviously they've been exposed to law in other countries, but their first exposure generally to U.S. law is just a one-year program. I think I would do something to that effect where there are certain mandatory classes to learn the basics and to learn the jargon and to speak the language, if you will. And then some elective courses, because you go into law school not always knowing what you wanna do. So it's important right. to be able to have some elective courses and figure out do I what is litigation versus transactional law, right? Like crim law versus civil. So sure, giving people the opportunity to learn the differences there so they can make kind of a, an educated guess as to what's right for them for their career. But I don't think I would make it for more than a year. Yeah, okay. So, so you did get a yeah. job after law school. You, you worked at a, a large firm. You went big law, right? So 
Um, I did. So tell tell us about like how long were you in Big Law? Like what was that experience like for you? Did they have a snack cart? Like sure. if you pass like ten, like they put bring in the snack cart and you could be I'll have that sandwich over there. It wasn't really like that. It really right? depends on the firm. Okay. It really depends right. on the firm. If you if you work past a certain hour, they will pay for your meal. Um, okay. So that there's there's at least that. Uh, Big law. Yeah. So I worked at Silicon Valley. I worked at Goodwin. Um, I got out, if you will, after <laughs> two years. Two years. Um, and when I, two years, I remember telling kind of the mid levels and the seniors I was leaving, and they all kind of looked at me like, wow, good for you. Like, kind of, I got really? out soon enough wow. where it's easier to, it's easier to leave the, the more junior you are because the golden handcuffs are as real as, right, as right. they say they and are. And you went through the whole like process in the summer, right? You were a summer associate where oh, yeah. they like, brought you to, you know, they bring you on the, the cruise ship or like they bring you the baseball game. I'm just going from like what I've read or like seen on, you know, TV because I was- They do do all that. <laughs> they do. <laughs> Again, I- I was in 2010, so it was a little bit better than the summers of 08 and 09 that yeah. were experiencing the financial crisis as it was right. unfolding. So you got but I was benefits. immediately after where yeah. they did provide some version of that mythical, you know, the, 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 that epic summer associate experience you hear in big law. Uh, but it wasn't as extreme. It wasn't like liquid lunches and golf yeah, sessions yeah, and, yeah. and things like that. We we actually worked and we worked pretty hard as summer associates. Okay. Um, but yes, you're taken out sometimes almost daily to really nice lunches and dinners and wine tastings and yeah. all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, you're certainly wine and dined. Uh, big law. I, I had a really positive experience in Big Law. I think I was fortunate enough to work in Silicon Valley where it's a little bit more of a casual culture. Um, the partners are really nice. You know, I, I myself didn't run into what a lot of my former classmates and friends ran into, which was um, more hostile environments in, in Big Law. But the expectations were always the same. You, yeah. you work. You work and you work nonstop. So wow. it was a short time for me, but for those two years, there was zero predictability around evenings, nights, weekends, holidays. Um, I, you know, I could work five weeks in a row without one day off. Um, wow! Uh, absolutely no predictability to plan a vacation. Um, my weekends were certainly not my own. I was working every single weekend. If I had an afternoon off or a morning off, I felt like this is wonderful. Like I have a whole weekend to myself. Um, you know, the, the joke is also you make so much money in big law and like, you have no time to spend it right, <laughs> while you're right. working there. So like, what, what are they keeping you uh, for? Like they have like these memos that you have to write at like four 30 on a Friday and they, they slap it on your desk and you're like, this needs to be done Monday morning. Like listen, and stuff like that. I mean, you're really busy. You're really yeah. busy. So I didn't have like memos necessarily because, so I was a corporate associate in the technology group. I was representing, both early stage and later stage technology companies, startup, you know, or being the earlier stage and later stage growth companies, we were doing everything from incorporating companies to taking them public, to selling them, to raising capital, helping them raise capital, um, venture money. So the, the deals were just flowing in. I mean, you could be working on three financings and M&A and then 10 other clients at any given time. I had whiteboards where I was keeping track of every single client I had, every single to do under every client, because there's no, it's really hard to keep up. Um, you have from almost year one, your own book of business, essentially, that you're helping the partner manage, and you're being staffed on a ton of transactions as they roll in. Does the partner look at your work, like as you do it sort of thing? Like, are you allowed to, yeah, they look at they, they do. I mean, it's very, Silicon Valley, especially is very much like a sink or swim environment. It's you better learn and you better learn quickly. And then we're starting to staff you alone on clients. And then they staff pretty leanly on deals. Like you might do a financing where it's you as the junior, one senior associate and the partner that's kind of just comes in and out of the deal. Okay. Um, so there's, there is a certain level of mentorship and you can always knock on the partner's door, at least off as I worked at and have something redlined so they can help you learn. But you, you learn really quickly because you do so much of everything okay. all the time. Like there's no break. Um, it's the best training in the world for sure. I, that's why I don't regret it. I mean, it was, I cried a lot during those two years <laughs> oh, uh, about wanting, 
about wanting a life, but I don't regret it. I was young. That's the time to kind of do it. And that's how I, yeah, I, true. I truly believe that's how you become a good attorney. You, you yeah. kind of grind for a while. Yep. Okay. So, all right. So let's bring you up to date or let's, let's get into, uh, was there anything else that you did before you launched uh, CGL? Was there any, was it big lot of CGL? Yeah. Okay. No, so I joined, a, I, I wanted to get out of law altogether. Okay. I didn't want to be pigeonholed as an attorney. I've always been more drawn to the business world. So okay. I actually joined a growth stage technology company out of San Francisco. And that's where I worked. Uh, I worked in strategic partnerships. I was doing business development there. Wow. Okay. Um, and that, that's, that's where I, that's where I learned what a company means, like what it means to work within a company, what that machine looks like, what is a sales department versus a marketing department? What's the value of business development? Um, that, that's where I learned all of that. And I truly believe it has a lot to do with kind of my starting CGL and why CGL has been successful in its kind of short time. Um, oh. Cause as a lawyer, you're not, you're not taught that. Right. right. Um, yeah. I had to, so how long did go you go into that the for? company and learn the DNA? So I did that for a couple of years. Okay. So and yeah, then I, I mean, went out on yeah. Go ahead. So then you okay? So then then you went out, and I just want to say um, I want to note something for everybody who's listening out there. Your LinkedIn is amazing. Like if everybody's not following Noam on LinkedIn, like you, they need to be because of all your posts. You know, I, I went through some of your posts and Thank you. they're very. I think they're very raw and they're very honest. And, um, you know, I, I appreciated reading those. Um, and also your partner, Hannah, I think I've actually connected with her at a different time, like maybe a few months ago, just um, kind of touch and go. And like you both write like really nice, um, just like raw uh, things about starting a business and, and a law firm. And it's very interesting actually what you have going on there. Um, so like, so like what led you to ultimately find and be a founder of CGL? So tell, tell us about that. Yeah. Well, thank you, first of all. Uh, we do spill our guts out on LinkedIn uh, and, and we'll get to that, but it's very much tied to who we are, our DNA as a company and our, our mission. Um, but CGL, so I had my daughter um, in early 2017 um, and I, I was in search of meaning right? I, I wanted something more meaningful. I needed a reason to leave such a small baby at home and, and go back to work. I needed something beyond, you know, the, the title or just the salary. And um, I mean, I, I needed to go and work and earn, but it, it had to be something that meant more to me. Uh, and so I, I did what I like to call a thoughtful pause. And I decided I'm not going back to my former job. And I did what most new parents don't do, which is I went traveling with my kid for months. Okay. Uh, I went to Israel. I went back to Israel. I went to France. I went to Italy. I mean, at one point we were like literally backpacking me and the six month old. Wow. And uh, yeah, sleeping in a different place every single night, kind of road tripping with my sister. And I was writing down my thoughts what do I want? What do I want? What do I want? It's, you know, my husband at one point said, stop saying what you don't want. That's so easy. Okay. You don't want to go back to big law. Okay. You don't want to go back to the tech company. What do you want? So I started writing down my yeses as they came to me. Um, and I realized I really want to work for myself yeah. and I want to contribute financially to my household. I want to work. Right. And I want to bring in Great. money and That's I want to terrific. support my family and I want to do good. I want impact. Um, and that's kind of how CGL came about. I mean, one day it just occurred to me, I have this degree, right? Just cause I took a detour doesn't mean I can't ever go back to it. Um, I can take on clients and I can work and I can work from home and I can set my own day and my own schedule. And so I pitched the idea to Hannah, uh, thinking that she would reject it outright because she had a really difficult experience in big law and she loved it. She was kind of in a similar place. She had had, you know, two kids under two years and also was searching for more meaning uh, and more autonomy in her life. So that's how, that's how CGL started. Um, both wow. Hannah and I searching for something that we felt didn't exist out there. It was a all or nothing decision. We either go back to corporate America, leave our kids at home for eight to 10 hours a day at best. 
uh, or, yeah. you know, or stay home and not, that felt so ridiculous to us. Like, of course that can't be it. Um, so how did so you know Hannah? Decided. Like, how did you, how did you know her to like present your idea to her? Hannah and I met in law school. We both went to Berkeley. Okay. Uh, we were super friendly at Berkeley, but we weren't very good friends. Uh, and then we became very close while studying for the bar exam. Don't ask me why or how I had time to make friends, but yeah. Hannah and I things. became yep. one of those things. We bonded over that experience uh, as well as many others. And we became really close friends and stayed in touch. And, and like I said, kind of we're, we were having kids around the same time and going through similar experiences of deciding to leave the corporate America, traditional kind of workplace and seeking something else. Um, and I, there was a yin and yang between me and her. I knew right. that if I was gonna go and do something, it had to be with her. I, I don't think I would have done it on my own. I, I wouldn't have wanted to. The That's motivation cool. I mean, came I like, when I like we the, both, yeah. yeah. I like those stories, like the friendships that sort of flourish after the fact. I mean, I see that in, yeah. in my college friends, like how, you know, like they might've been a little younger at the time, but now because of life experience, you know, I'm kind of, kind of close to them. And I think that's, that's a wonderful thing. So like, what was a yeah. major challenge that you first, like when you were starting out that you faced um, as a new business owner? Um, and like, what do you think led to your success ultimately for uh, CGO? Yeah, um, so many challenges because we had never done it before. I think the biggest one at first when you start a business is that you have to do everything yourself. Right. We're not a venture backed company, right? We had to put a little bit of money into our own venture. And then it's, it's like, eat what you kill. And you have to do, you have to hustle there. there yep. So we were providing all the substantive legal work to our clients and running the business operations, finance. You know, I didn't even have money for a bookkeeper, like right out the gate. I was trying to, we were trying to learn QuickBooks. Um, so I think that's, I think that's the biggest challenge. And I don't think that's unique to a law firm. Uh, when you're first starting out, it's, you have no one to delegate anything to you. You just kind of have to wing it and do it all yourself. So it was, you know, there was so much breathing room when we finally started making some real money and we could hire and we could, you know, engage kind of talented consultants and contractors um, and not do everything on our own. So I think that by far was the biggest challenge for a while. Um, I think also when you start a new business, there's, I listened to a podcast by the founder of UGG, uh, you know, UGG Boots, yep. and he equates a business to basically the, the life cycle of a human being and that you can't skip any stages. So you have to go through infancy and then move on to toddlerhood and then adolescence right. that and was then the, teenage. Yep. Yeah. It yeah. That was one of the posts. Yep. Yeah. That's a yeah. very good analogy. I, I really. kind of, like that. I loved it when I heard it because I said, this is so true. You can't skip any phases. I mean, maybe if you raise capital, because I've seen this with some of my clients, you can kind of skip a phase, but, but even so not really in, in the sense of the maturity of your company internally. Um, so I, I really connected to that. And, I, and that's been my experience for sure with CGL. Um, you know, I think yeah. our, you asked about what's made us successful. I think First and foremost, my partnership kind of with Hannah. And then we later, you know, added a third partner, Jenny. Okay. I think you get really lucky with a good partner. Uh, sometimes, you know, everything looks great in Kumbaya at first, and then it falls apart down the road. And I think I've been nothing but fortunate when it's come to partners. Um, so I think that's, I think that's been a huge, a huge part of our success. Um, and I think our message, you know, we haven't really dug into CGL's message and, you know, what makes us different, but we talk a lot about changing the nature of work and autonomous yep. working and, and creating a better environment for both attorneys as well as any employee. Um, and we realized early on that that message was resonating with both kind of attorneys and non-attorneys. And we got really loud about it. I mean, you mentioned our LinkedIn content, Hannah, and I just started writing. Yeah. Like, let's just, let's just talk about this and let's, let's talk about it and let's be really raw about it and let's get a conversation going. And I think that's always been our intention to change the narrative. Yeah. I mean, I think that's how I really came across uh, you all. Was, I think Hannah had a post like months ago, it might've been a year ago. And I just remember, and I, when I saw, okay, so we're going to do a podcast and I saw your partner, I'm like, oh, that name sort of rings a bell. And it was because mm -hmm. of 
LinkedIn posts and interactions. So keep there you go. That. Yeah, that was that's so that's yeah. what you want, right? That's that's great. We we had some of our posts, our early posts go viral. Yeah. Um, and th this was just our raw stories, right? Yeah. This was literally just the truth. Uh, Hannah's first story that went viral was about how she missed a lot of her son's first. Yep. Um, and the response was kind of out of this world. And we went, oh, okay, people are listening and this is really resonating with people. And yes, we're a law firm and we talk about that all the time too and what we do kind of professionally, but uh, the greater mission of the firm is is to uh, impact the conversation. Yeah, no, definitely. And I, I mean, I read that because I know at the end of that particular post, she says, I had a second son and I didn't miss the first, right? Is that? Yeah. Yep, yeah. That. So that's, yeah, that's terrific. Those, there you uh, go. Those, I mean, keep, keep it that. I mean, everybody needs some inspiration as we try to provide here at Lawyer Stories as well. Um, yeah. So like you don't have physical offices. Um, so like what, how, how is that working out? And like, you know, no, no set working hours. Obviously that's a good thing. Um, so like how, tell us about that. Yeah, we are a distributed company. I've learned a lot about this world since we started CGL and started reading about what we felt passionate about. So we're called a distributed company. There's no headquarters. There's no H, you know, there's, there's no central hub. Um, this was very kind of different for a law firm, especially pre COVID. Now a lot of people are working in this way because they've been thrust into the situation with the pandemic. Um, but we don't call ourselves remote because there's nothing to be remote from. We don't have remote employees. We're not remote partners. We're fully distributed. The company yep. sits wherever its people sit. Right. Um, and we're asynchronous, meaning we're not in one time zone. We have people across multiple states within the U.S. And uh, at one point, Hannah was abroad. I am now abroad. So the firm kind of works 24 hours a day, if you will, uh, nonstop. And that's called asynchronous distributed. Um, we are to, to say we have no set hours is because I would never monitor my employees and when they go online. Um, I don't think that that's an important part of managing people and delivering yeah. value. Uh, you. We, you know, we believe that if you empower people to to live and work autonomously, and for us that means that they set up their their work and their life to maximize their well being. And if they maximize their well being. They'll be more productive. They'll be more efficient. Love I love that. They'll be more motivated. Yeah. Uh, and 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 therefore, because our product is services, they'll bring a better service to our clients. Right. Um, and I, so that's a kind of a little bit about our culture uh, and what we're trying to do here. And as simple as this sounds, like some people might work better in the evening, get their you know juices flowing and the creative juices flowing in the evening than working that nine to five. You know, so we're yeah. So I think like that's maybe that's like the simple concept, but I, you know, I've seen that too, like in my workplace. And I think you have to have, especially like going through all that schooling and being an attorney, like you have to come to a place where you do give somebody some professional courtesy. So I totally I yeah. agree with that. A, a couple of things, you know, we like to say we're non-adult daycare. Um, right. I'm not here to, to, to monitor you, to micromanage you. If I hired you, it's because I believe you know how to do your job. And if you don't, then we'll part ways amicably and we'll, right, we'll all move on. Um, and, and another thing is, you know, we, you were, I'm now blinking, but I, um, we were talking about, now I'm completely losing my train of thought. You had mentioned something that had triggered that, but we can move on. Oh, okay. So, no, I was just talking about like working in the evening or working as opposed to like a nine to five. That's right. Night. Yeah, that's kind of like the culture. That, yeah. The, well, that's right. So another term I learned since starting CGL is there's knowledge-based workers. We're part of the knowledge-based workers. You have software developers, attorneys, CPAs, right? Our capital is our knowledge and we need a Wi-Fi connection and a computer to do our job, essentially, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and so what's to say that you work like well in a nine to five setting and I work well in a nine to five setting, right? We all have different times of day and, and also different ways of working to maximize our productivity. So I might work better in sprints. I'm sitting down for two hours. I'm taking a nap for an hour. I'm coming back for two hours. You might work really well, like you said, from six to 10 PM. 
Um, so why would I ever force you if, if I'm trying to get the most out of you as an employee, why would I ever force you to come into the, you know, into an office from nine to five, if you only really turn things on at 6 PM. Right. Right. No, I, yeah. I understand. I mean, there, and there are, and like you said, like knowledge-based employees, cause there are those jobs out there, you know, that you require you to be at certain places at the time because you have customers or clients, but this is a different, you know, it's a different, uh, level of, of job. And I this think is this specific is, to exactly this type of job specific to being an attorney and giving, having, um, the professional course courtesy. Um, so, yeah. so go, going into like the pandemic, like, first of all, how long has, um, how long has CGL been around now? We've been around a little over three years, three years. Okay. So how was it? Um, tell us a little bit about the, the pandemic, um, working through the pandemic and like how, how it will change the way that we all look at jobs in the future. Like, do you think everybody will be working remotely? I, I think the pandemic is obviously thrust distributed work. Lots of people call it virtual remote teleworking, you know, kind of into the center of the conversation. Uh, I think many companies and employers would have preferred not to be kind of in the position that they're in. Uh, I don't think this comes naturally to a lot of organizations, unfortunately. I mean, where where I hope this goes is I hope that we transform into a mostly distributed work culture for knowledge-based, you know, industries, because I think that it creates more inclusivity in the workplace. I mean, I can go into that as well as to why I think that beyond just allowing you to work in more comfortable clothing, you know, not commute, less pollution, but there's also a level of inclusivity. This allows people who don't fit into the mold of a nine to five office job, uh, which tend to be uh, a lot of women <laughs> yeah. um, in our society and, and other sectors of the society. Um, so I, I hope this will lead to an evolution. I hope there will be you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of jobs that open up in distributed organizations. I think the change will be more gradual. I think that employers will unfortunately revert back to older models and ways as soon as they're able to. Um, I think that they'll choose to do things like mandate vaccinations in the workplace as opposed to actually make a change in the workplace around the way people work. I'm not weighing in kind of on the vaccination piece right now. I'm just saying I think that they'll choose other paths in order to bring people back kind of to have their what I like to call the butt in the chair, you know, mentality. Yeah. for CGL, in, in a great way, we didn't have to make any adjustments. Nothing changed the way we worked, you know, during the pandemic. We've been really fortunate in that way. You know, we've tried to provide as much guidance as possible to the market with, you know, things that we publish as well as to our clients. Like, how do you do this? How do you run an organization in this way? Um, so, and, and we've done, you know, we've done well this year. I, we're lucky in that a lot of our clients are technology-based clients. We also work in the cannabis space. Um, some of our clients have been impacted, but, you know, generally speaking, it's been, you know, we've been able to kind of ride the COVID wave pretty well. And I feel, you know, really grateful for that. Yeah. No, we that's... grew a lot kind of as a company. We hired a lot this year. Really? So, so you have a lot of uh, mm-hmm. people doing work. That's great. Uh, yeah, and yeah. You're all over too, like all over the country. And is that correct? Yeah, we have people, we have both employees as well as contractors, and they span many, many states uh, at this point, as well as a couple in Canada. Wow. Um, I myself am in Israel. Hannah was in Costa Rica with her family, my co founder, for seven, eight months. Wow. So in 2020, yeah, it's fully, like I said, distributed and asynchronous organization. So that, that's awesome. So this is some point, like, where do you see yourself um, with CGL in like the future in like five years, 10 years? Uh, I, I think where I see us is where we can have the most impact. You know, we're, the narrative is only, is only, in, is only powerful if we can prove that our model works and we can prove that we've been able to impact people's lives positively. So yep. Uh, I, I like to say growth for the sake of growth is not what's interesting to me. That's not what gets me out of bed in the morning. It's growth for the sake of impact. So if it means that I get to hire 20, 50 more people because I get to impact 
those people's lives and the way they work, you know, positively and the way they live, then that's wonderful. And obviously the bigger we get as a company, the more, uh, you know, our message uh, kind of makes its way out there and we can affect the conversation. So to tell you that I have an exact number of, uh, you know, be it revenue or employees in the next five years of where I want to go, not really. Yeah. I mean, we do, we have business, right? We have a business model and we have trajectories, but um, I want impact and, yeah. and I want to continue to put that message out there that there's an alternative way to work. And I truly believe that, you know, that it creates for a more positive work experience and therefore more, you know, yeah. a, a better life. And yeah, I mean, going back to your like LinkedIn posts, I mean, I think that's something obviously, hopefully you'll continue. Um, Cause I like to read those. And um, have you, have you met, have you connected with people on LinkedIn, by the way? Like, have you? Oh my goodness. It's crazy. Oh my goodness. I, it's, I do my best to keep up as much as I can. So if anyone who's listening has been like waiting a few months for a, a response, the comments, it can be, they can be in the dozens and they can be in the hundreds and yep. then the private messages are in the hundreds. Wow. Uh, so both myself and Hannah do our absolute best while avoiding making that our full-time job to respond thoughtfully to people to you know say, I heard you, thank you so much when you spill your guts, people spill their guts to you, right? Yeah. When you're yeah. raw and authentic, yeah. people that, that elicits a very similar response from other people. So the messages we've gotten are mind blowing. Um, and it's hard to, on a daily basis, be as thoughtful in the response as well. So we try our best and we try our best to respond to as many comments as well as possible. Wow. That's, that's incredible. Um, so, yeah. So what advice, so congratulations on, um, you know, the successful business, CGL, like just the whole culture that you're starting and that you have. Um, so what advice, like, would you have you. any other entrepreneurs out there? Uh, this is so cliche because I feel like this is what a lot of other founders say, but just do it. We Googled how to start a law firm. Yeah. That is like how CGL started. We Googled how to start a law firm yeah. and we were so ignorant in the best way possible because you, you know, we wouldn't have done this had we known how, how much work it was going to be uh, and how much red tape there is for attorneys operating, you know, in the U S and, and what you have to be careful about. But I, I, I heard this once, like when you smell fear, walk towards it. And at least professionally, I can say that Hannah and I have that attitude. I don't know if I always have that attitude on a personal kind of level, yeah. but you know, it's a very fail forward mentality. Worst case scenario, someone rejects us. Worst case scenario, the client leaves us. Like it's just, it's just a do it mentality. Um, maybe it's an innate hustle and maybe it's just, we realized early on that that's that's just what you got to do uh, as yeah. a, you know, early stage company. Yeah. Wow. Okay. That's great. Um, and I, I'll add one more thing. Please. I think you need a higher purpose. Uh, it doesn't have to be save the world, uh, right? It, it might be, but it doesn't have to be. But I think that if you are just building a business for the sake of building it and growing revenue, I don't, I'm not sure that's enough motivation to keep going during the hard times. I think having a purpose beyond that as to why you're doing something, and it might be to provide for my family, and that's a higher purpose, or it might be, you know, to solve the homelessness problem in Los Angeles. I mean, it, it can be whatever it is, but okay. you need a bigger purpose, I think, to yeah. get through, you know, difficult endeavors, whether it's starting a business or going through law school or whatever it may, you know, yeah. whatever it is for you. That's great. Um... So is there anything that we left out today that you'd like to share? I mean, I think that's basically, I mean, basically I it. And, and I think we covered a lot. You had yeah. really kind of thoughtful questions and I appreciate it. You know, yeah. we have a podcast of our own. The yes. CGL podcast. The podcast. Yes. The yeah. CGL podcast. Um, right. The CGL podcast. And you can, you know, listen to us on Spotify, Apple, Google, wherever you listen to your podcasts and visit our website at cgl-llp.com. And, 
and please follow us on LinkedIn. Um, Hannah Gentone uh, and myself, you know, we we really we share a lot about our lives and about our experience running this company. Um, and I hope that people find value in that. That's great. Um, and I did read the post about uh, the podcast about you're like, oh, I have to listen to my own voice because I, you know, like when I'm driving to to work, my my full time job, I. Uh, you know, sometimes I want to listen to the previous podcast, but I, I get like two minutes mm -hmm. in and I'm just like, all right, I'll listen to that later. <laughs> <laughs> so. It's so true. It, it was such a scary thing. Talk about, you know, you smell fear and you walk towards it. We had, uh, we have a, a wonderful business consultant who, who had originally pitched, pitched this idea months ago of starting a podcast and both Hannah and I went, are you crazy? Like, yeah. no, thank you. I, no, no. That's, that's like a little bit too far out of our comfort zone. And yeah, the first time we recorded, you know, I was cringing. I was like, I, I don't know if I can do this. And I found a, a passion for it. And it's fun. I yeah. get to do it with one of my closest friends. And we, we get to just chat it out for, you know, once a week. That's great. Um, yeah. So that's the CGL podcast. Um, Noam yeah. Cohen, CGL Law. Check them out. Check her out on LinkedIn. Uh, Great, st good stuff. Great. I think we covered a lot. I really appreciate you being yeah. here today, spending some time sure. going through your story. Thank you. Terrific story. Um, for everybody else out Thanks there, so much. Uh, at lawyer underscore stories, uh, check us out, uh, DM us, send us an email, wherever you are in the world today, enjoy yourselves. Cheers. The Lawyer Stories podcast is produced by Marketing the Law. Are you looking at your social presence every day? Potential clients are. Learn how to magnetize your brand with the help of Marketing the Law. Find us on Instagram at Marketing the Law to learn more.